do something I don't normally do this morning. I'm going to need your help to preach what I'm going to preach on and about because without question never seen it to be any different this would be no different than it's been in the past but when you talk about what we're going to talk about this morning it'll be like sticking your head in a hornet's nest intentionally and when you do you can expect some stings so I'm asking you as we get ready and I'm going to read you a a couple of texts this morning and I would like for you to just bear with me for a minute while I set this up but you'll see within the first four verses why the concern and why the burden is there as a church and as Christians in the last days there are things that are going to happen to you that have been smatterings in the past but it's an unprecedented time and there are things that are going to happen to you as a Christian where the devil is using every tool, every opportunity, every thing that he can use at his disposal in an attempt to get your eyes off the main thing and to get you out. And as the time for the Lord to come gets closer, it's going to get more intense. It's going to be more difficult. And the warning will be less heeded than it should be. Because life after today for us as Christians has to at least have our eyes open and to realize things are not going to go back where they were. And I'm not talking about after the virus or when or if the war is ever over. The spiritual pressure on Christians nowadays at home, in their homes, in their families, in their churches, at work, everywhere you can imagine is greater now than it looks like it has ever been. His tricks are definitely much more prevalent today. Stand with me if you would please. I'll give you a few verses. Quoting the best that I can from Ephesians chapter number 6. He says this, for we wrestle not. I want you to turn to Ephesians 4. Brother Larry, you can get us in Ephesians 4. Quoting from Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness in high places. In 2 Timothy, he warns us that we can be taken captive by the devil at his will for rejecting what the truth is. He warns us again in the passage that we're about to go to, but in 1 Peter 5, he almost at the top of his lungs, screams out not just about the comfort, not just about the burden, and to trust the Lord with those things, but then he says, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That hasn't changed. You know what he said? Be sober, be vigilant, pay attention. Because the devil is going to attack you in ways you never even thought possible. And before you know it, he's roaring when he's right about to pounce on you. In the text before you right now, the Bible says this in verse number, pick it up in 24. Ephesians 4, verse number 24, And that put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness... Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor. We're members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither 
give place to the devil. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, he tells you that any thought that enters into your mind that lifts itself up or raises itself up above the knowledge of God is to be immediately brought captive and brought into subjection under God because the devil, as in 2 Corinthians 11, shows up as a minister of righteousness or his, as an angel of light and as ministers, as ministers of righteousness. Would you agree with me then that the devil is so divisive, but he is also such a master of disguise that he can show up and without a Bible and the Holy Spirit, we won't even recognize him when he shows up or how he chooses to operate. One of the biggest mistakes that we make before Brother Larry prays is that we think we know enough about the devil to recognize him when he moves. And I want to suggest to you this morning that the devil is wiser than any of us here and wiser than anybody except Jesus Christ, including the angels. And for us to underestimate him and to think that we understand clearly where he's coming from and what it is that he's up to is for us to play the fool. To think that we think we understand how he works. I'm telling you, the wiles of the devil, the tricks of the devil that he tells you that you're to quench those fiery darts with in Ephesians 6 when you put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the gospel preparation of peace and pick up the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith whereby we quench the fiery darts of the devil. Those tricks, those wild, those fiery darts are beyond what you and I have the ability to understand without God's help. So preacher, it's kind of a sobering thing. Yeah, but I would be willing to say right now, if you're not aware, there are more attacks going on in this congregation of people per capita than has gone on in a very long time. May not be a message that you need today, but as time clicks on, I can assure you that you're going to need it in the future. Brother Larry, you pray. Ask the Lord to cover it in the blood, if you would, please, and we'll do our best to give you a few things. Lord, we bow our heads this morning. We do ask that, first of all, and most of all, Lord, that you would cover this place in the blood of the Lord Jesus, and our hearts as well, in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't say that enough and put enough emphasis on the blood and on the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that we would, even in what the preacher said from the previous hour and even now, that we would take into consideration, God, that it is a supernatural warfare that we're in. Mm -hmm. oh, Lord, in the battle that we do on our best day, we're so weak and frail. And Lord, as strong as we can try to build and fortify ourselves, we have to fight ourselves the flesh. And then do diligence, God, to the spiritual and keeping him strong as well as being a conqueror for us to follow. We thank you for the word of God as we pray and continue to pray. We thank you for a man to preach it to us and, yes. Yes. and give us the message that we need for the hour, which is very important. And I guess most of all this morning, I pray, Lord, that uh, from the situations we all come from and have gone through in the previous evening or this morning even, would you settle us just a little bit this morning, yeah. oh Lord, to where we could hear? Yeah. Lord, where something can get down into our ears and into a heart, a God, that might be open to you, that might be in submission to you, and have a want to to do your will in our lives. We need you, Lord, that more than we need even the breath that we breathe, uh, Lord, to to take a step ahead of the other and to fight. Now, Lord, we ask for strength for our pastor in this message, particularly this message. We're not praying about this evening right now. We're asking for help this hour. And I pray, God, as we listen, that we would pray for him. And, Lord, that we would pray for ourselves. Uh, God, that we'd be able to, like we said here, open our hearts. Lord, help us to put ourselves to the side for a while, uh, God, with our ears open. We give you the glory in our lives. We're not trying to make it a, a, a distressful time in praying. 
Because we do thank you, Lord, for your love and your compassion. Yes. And for caring enough to have caring enough for us to have a place to come hear you. Now we look for you, Lord, this morning. We will seek your face out. We thank you for the good singing, the uplifting in it, that those that have lended their talents to do so and sing to us and not entertainment, God, but to help us. Not a platform, but to sing to us and lift you up. We give you all the glory now of what's going to be said and done. May you have the preeminence in this place. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. Be seated. I dare say if I were to ask anyone here today to throw out a welcome mat or to open up a door and to allow the devil to come into your life, into your home, into what you do, that everyone here would say, that's ridiculous, I'm not about to do it. At the onset of the message, I would like for you to at least consider this. Demonic things and demonic entities far exceed rock and roll music. I didn't say they weren't in rock and roll music. But they far exceed rock and roll music. For most of you, that wouldn't be a trap that you would likely or easily fall into it. They far exceed horror movies. The guy with the things on his fingers and the guy that jumps out of the water with a hockey mask on and the, whatever the other advertisements are out, Rosemary's Baby, The Exorcist, whatever's around. I don't care to update it with modern movies. You understand the concept. It far exceeds just the filth that comes pumped into your house. One of the greatest things that the devil is good at is to get you by smoke and mirrors to look at something that in and of itself is a truth, but it's not the main truth. It's actually a deception to get you to focus on rock and roll music and how somebody's dressing and what somebody is doing and, and the crowd they run with and all those. While those things may in fact be devilish and demonic in, their, in and of themselves, and that's true, we know that, that is minuscule compared to where we're headed today. That is a bad place, but the majority is, is everybody thinks that, well, if I'm not watching the bad movies, and I'm not talking like the devil and acting like the devil, which are wrong to do, you understand that, I'm, I'm not playing that down. But for those of you that, that doesn't even affect you. You don't listen to the wrong music. You don't go to the wrong places. You don't hang out with the wrong people. So now the idea can be, well, I don't do that stuff, so the devil doesn't affect me. None of what I'm going to show you today has anything to do with that. It doesn't mean that's not devilish and wrong and that you should be separated from it. But this is far and beyond youth camp preaching. When we go to youth camp, we've been doing them for years, and what a lot of the parents want us to do is to preach the world out of their kids. But I can't preach the world out of your kids if the world is in your home. That's an impossibility. And you take them away for four or five days and take all their devices and do all that stuff and they're pristine and doing everything that's right. And I got to tell you, per capita, our kids really do want to do right. I will say that on occasion they actually mess up like you did. But you have that kind of amnesia where you forget where you went and what you did. And then you fail to have the grace that you need. But that's another story. Where we're going today is to show you that we can all wind up giving the devil a comfortable place even sitting in a church. Might I remind you that when the devil went and tempted the Lord in the wilderness tempted the Lord in the wilderness. I'll say that again, tempted the Lord in the wilderness. If he's not afraid to tempt the Lord, do you think for a second he's afraid to tempt you? One of the temptations, he guess where he took him? To the pinnacle of the temple. If you think the devil is afraid of church, you are completely misguided. The devil likes church. He likes religion. The devil doesn't have to spend time in the bar room, the back seat of a car. The devil doesn't have to spend time at the movie theater. He doesn't need to spend time at the shopping mall. You say, where will you find the devil? In the place of worship. 
You'll find the devil every morning in your quiet time when you sit down to read the Bible and all of a sudden there's all kind of interruptions and you're thinking, man, it's quiet. I'm having a cup of coffee. I'm trying to get in the book here and get me something to get me through the day. And man, all of a sudden, I mean, it is just unstoppable. If nothing else, if it's not the telephone, it's the thought process. You can't turn it off. And then you pray and you plead the blood and while you're praying, something comes to mind from 40 years ago and you're thinking where'd that come from? The devil. You can't ignore the time that it showed up. It's interesting sometimes in a church service when the Lord's moving, we've seen it even happen at youth camp. That when the Lord is moving and you can sense that God's moving just like when we were hearing the singing that we were hearing today and you can sense that the Lord's moving and people were being sensitive to those things. It's interesting how all of a sudden somebody's kidneys scream out, I got to go now. You can't ignore the timing of that. That right at the right time the devil squeezes the kidney and says, now, why wait till the invitation? It's interesting if you pay attention much that somebody who failed or forgot to turn off their phone, they didn't mean anything by it. They came to church, they literally forgot, and everything's going along and the Lord is working. And then right at that time where the Lord is getting your attention, somebody's phone will go off. And just like that, it's broken. It's just like, oh, the moment passed, it's gone. You say, that's just happenstance. No, it's not happenstance. When the prince of the power of the air decides right at the right time to interrupt something that God's trying to do. He always wants to interrupt His words. Not a play and not a big show and all that, but when His words are going out, the devil can't wait to say, don't listen to Him, listen to me. And so then there is that that takes place. The kids act up right at the wrong time. And you say, what is that? It's a demonic way of trying to supernaturally hijack what it is that you're trying to hear. But here's a bigger problem. The bigger problem is, is that maybe some of you aren't aware that you made a nice little nest, a nice little stronghold, a, a castle, a place that should belong to the Lord, but you've made that place yourself for the devil to feel completely comfortable there. I'm going to show you a few examples of where the devil's comfortable and how maybe unbeknownst to you, you've made him feel like he's welcome in your house anytime. You said you didn't want him there, but you didn't realize you were hanging a big welcome sign outside the door to your heart and saying, sure, come on in. And here's what I'd like. Can you share that castle with the Lord and you at the same time. Can I have both of you in there? The analogy is nowadays they draw it with a, a good guy on one side and a little devil on the other side. Well, the Lord doesn't share His glory with any. So now the Holy Spirit is grieved and if the devil has a foothold in your life, he has your life. Because at that moment, the Holy Spirit is grieved and unless you do something to make him feel unwelcome, you know what he'll do? He will expand his territory. Do you remember the story real quickly about... Remember, Nehemiah was trying to get the walls built and Tobiah and Sambalat, Tobiah and Sambalat began to try to disrupt all of that building going on. And it's an interesting thing that it really wasn't an attempt to just disrupt the walls. Ultimately, what Tobiah wanted was to move in where God belonged. Tobiah's name means wolf in Hebrew. And so here's what happens. That, not that I study Hebrew, don't misunderstand. That's just the name that's given him, not by happenstance. You say, what did you do? I looked it up in a regular dictionary. But it's interesting that after they were extricated or removed from that area and were to be outside the wall, that then they came back in the wall. And then before long, they're doing commerce on Sunday. Or for them, it's the Sabbath day, the Saturday. And then before long, Tobiah says, listen to the priest, to the priest, to the priest. I would like to move in here. My living quarters needs to be of all places, the places where the people that are supposed to take care of the Lord. Right? Right? And guess what happens? The priest moves all of God's stuff out and moves Tobiah's stuff in. 
When Nehemiah shows up, he realizes they're not doing what he had instructed them to do according to what the Lord had told them. And then he goes in there and to his amazement, he walks into the temple. He walks into that place that has been so gloriously rebuilt and now refurbished and now we're having the great worship service. And Nehemiah says, something is wrong. And he goes in and to his amazement, Tobiah is living in God's house. The wolf had gone in and kicked the sheep out. The wolf, like the lion, is a carnivore. And all he wants to do is have plenty of food for his substance. And when sheep are close by, he don't care. He just soon eat sheep as anything. Well, you know the story that Nehemiah kicked him out and he had kind of a come to Jesus meeting. But the thing I want you to realize is this, that... We have now been given inside us the temple of the Holy Spirit is supposed to be us. And sometimes we have him removed so that we can make room for the devil. Again, raise above the carnal application of that and think that it has to do with somebody shooting dope or drinking today. It's much more than that. As a matter of fact, when I do get around to it, none of those are my illustrations. Can it lead to that? Oh, sure, absolutely, no question. Can it lead to sinful behaviors? Absolutely, no question whatsoever. You're right, but you're wrong if you think that while you're looking over here, watch the birdie, watch the birdie, that the devil is not sliding in to some of you who perceive yourself as the most holy, the most righteous, the most perfect, the most persnickety of, oh my God, I would never do that. I only have three channels on my TV. I don't have internet. I don't have Facebook. I don't have social media. I don't have TikTok. I don't have Instagram. I don't have Snapchat. I don't meet my girlfriends and boyfriends on Tinder. I don't do anything. I don't even mess with a cell phone. Oh, I I would never do that. And the devil is literally living inside you. In the temple. And from his perch, he instructs you, look at them, they're smoking. Look at them, they're drinking. Look at them, they're going to movies. Look at what they did. I can assure you, it is not God that is bringing other people to your attention. When your attention is always on other people, it is not God asking your opinion of them. But somebody is. Look at them. The interesting thing there is, is that when you talk about the Lord, you know what he says all through his Bible? Look at me. Paul says, keep your eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. Whenever you have this insatiable desire to be involved in what everybody else is doing. Oh, I just got to... Send a text message, an email, a phone call. I just, I just got to be, and you're inordinately involved or interested in other people. That's not the Lord. Amen. That's the devil saying, did you see them? Did you see him? Did you see her? And you know what the devil's trying to do? Don't look at yourself. Don't dare consider you might be a problem. Don't dare consider that I'm really comfortable with you right now. People say, if the devil were to show up, most everybody would jump out of their skin. I'm not so sure. I think if the devil were to show up, he'd be kind of like, oh yeah, well I kind of do know him. I've been meeting him for lunch here and there and talking to him over supper and an occasional cup of coffee. And he's kind of, I mean, he understands how it is when I have to lie to cover up for something I shouldn't have been doing. Yeah, but isn't the devil the liar and the father of it? Look, if you will, please, in Ephesians chapter number four, would you agree that we might have created certain conditions whereby the Holy Spirit is actually comfortable, uncomfortable, because the devil is present and it's not all flesh. You've opened up a door. You say, why? Could I ask you this question? Look in verse number 25. He says, wherefore put away what? You say, well, preacher, I don't lie. That's an attribute of the devil, isn't it? 
You say, well, I'm not a liar. Are you sure? If Jesus Christ is truth and his book is truth and the Holy Spirit is true, then the closest thing would be, or the closest thing to a lie, or the most dangerous kind of lie, would be one that contains part of the truth. Right? Just a little. 90% true, mostly true, but just kind of 10% of a, uh, of a lie. I, I mean, my profile is pretty much true. If you were to go back 35 years, that's where I really was. But to judge a Christian for where they were 35 years ago, that's a little unfair, wouldn't you say? But it's interesting when we present ourselves to other people, how we present ourselves as to how we were in the past instead of, hey, I'm not the same person that I used to be. I'm just saying, I'm not talking about being dogmatic, cutting lines and, and saying, but have you ever called yourself a Christian? But not really act like a Christian? You say, well, I'm a preacher. No, I'm, I didn't say you were a liar. I just said, are you a Christian? Could I give you a test? Could we look at it and see? Sure. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, he said, uh, whoever you forgive, I forgive also, um, lest we wind up beating him down and this and that and the other. And he said, lest Satan should get an advantage over us. You're a Christian, right? Yep. You're not a liar, right? You're a Christian, right? What, what happened to the you? You were agreeing with me and now you're kind of slowing up a little. You're a Christian, right? Okay. You put me in one of them box things, preacher. Okay. All right. How good are you at forgiving others? Or do you just take your doll baby and go to the house? I didn't, I didn't say when somebody comes to you and says, you know, I was just so wrong and, and I'm, I'm asking you to please forgive me. Sure, no problem. I'm not talking about that. When was the last time that you forgave somebody that you wanted to hold it against them for the rest of their life? Amen. Amen. Preacher, what is that? That's a comfortable place for the devil. He likes that. That's where he dwells. You say, why? He's never forgiven the Lord for kicking him out for his own behaviors. You never see a place where the devil said to the Lord, I'm at fault. I was wrong. I said I was going to take over. I'm going to do it. And guess what happens? The Lord said, hey, well, I'll forgive you. No, uh-uh. He's not even asking for forgiveness. So guess what happens? An attribute of the devil is somebody that never forgives somebody else. You say, why? For manipulation and control. Amen. But it's also, can I say, a lack of faith. The Lord said, I'll take care of it. Ah. That's tough, isn't it? But when was the last time that you considered that it is an attribute definitely of the, of the devil, not of the Lord? Have you ever lied by saying something a certain way so as to try to give the, the, the persona, the idea, that's not the right word, but, but to try to give the opinion, the idea, without saying anything, you just say, well, I'm just saying, and however you do your eyebrows. Or the voice inflection. As if there's more to the story, knowing they're not going to ask for more to the story. But have you ever embellished something to make it look like something that it's not really, but it fits your narrative or your agenda? Have you ever used those words, those things that the devil can manage to get himself into? And it really doesn't seem like much... Honey, where were you? Why do you ask? Be just easy just to go, I was at the Philip 66 getting gas. Or racetrack. What's the matter? You don't trust me? I wonder if there's been a deceptive spirit somewhere. I wonder if maybe even the person asking knows that they're judging someone else because they themselves are not always forthright and truthful. Because oftentimes what we suspect in other people is what we are guilty of ourselves. Overly suspicious people are thinking that other people are thinking the way they think. 
They're always accusing somebody of lying. Where did they get that idea? I can tell you the father of lies is firmly planted on the throne in their heart and they see everything through a lying spirit. Everybody's lying to me. Everybody is telling an untruth. Everybody. No. Hold on. That's Tobiah growling in there. Everybody's not lying to you. But he's sitting on the throne. Because he's comfortable. I used to know a guy. He's dead now. And honest to the Lord that made me. That guy could look at you eyeball to eyeball and bald face. You knew the truth absolutely and lied to you. And he believed his own lie. And he honestly believed when he would tell you the lie that you believed what he said. He was so demented in his mind. I wonder if sometimes if we consider that even the slightest little bit of a lie makes us a liar enough that the Lord would write in Philippians chapter number 4 of all the things he says of whatsoever things are pure and righteous and whatsoever things are of great virtue. You know one of the things he says? Whatsoever things are honest. It doesn't mean that you have to go out right off the bat and be honest with everybody. Yeah, preacher, you look like you gained about 10 pounds. I'm just being honest. I'm suspicious of someone who's always telling me, I'm just being honest. That's a thing you hide behind to hurt people. Amen. The truth can hurt people. Amen. Sometimes some things are better left unsaid. Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians, you know, he said, I've done my best to do things honest in the sight of God and all men. Meaning I can give the perception by who I hang around with. If I'm running around with crooks and dishonest people and doing business with them, I can give the persona that I also am dishonest. And that I'm lying when I'm trying to accomplish a goal. The salesman's tactic oftentimes, because what will be said of it is, is that, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and do what best facilitates what my agenda is. After all, you got to make a living. Do you have to make a living by employing one of the devil's greatest tricks? You know what he's trying to convince you of? The Lord's not coming. The pandemic is going to wipe out people before the Lord gets here. You're going to go through the tribulation. You say, preacher, now wait a minute. Hold on just a second. I've heard preachers say that. Who said preachers can't lie? As a matter of fact, in the last days, that lying spirit becomes part of the preachers in the last day. That's why you have to have a book in your lap to find out. I don't care who the preacher is. I don't care what school he went to. I don't care you say what can happen. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, if they get this answer, I, the Lord, have put a lying spirit in the mouth of that prophet. He calls him up there in, uh, in, uh, also in Ezekiel, I mean in uh, Chronicles, in uh, Second Chronicles. And he says to him, he said, listen, I got a problem with this particular king over here and with these 400 prophets there. It's in the passage with Micaiah there. And he says to him, you know, what will I do? And a lying spirit comes up and said, I'll go. And the Lord said, well, how are you going to do it? He said, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets. And the Lord said, works for me. And let him go. One spirit put a lying spirit in the mouth of all those prophets. And they lied from the pulpit. Amen. With the King James under their arm. And lied. 2 Corinthians 11. Angel of light ministers as ministers of righteousness. What is a telltale sign of the devil being comfortable in you and in a church? It is a lying spirit. I'm going to lie. Doesn't want to make you tell the truth about yourself. When you look in the mirror of God's word and God says, Hey, peacock. Yes, sir. How about this? Let's work on your rotten attitude. You going to call him a liar? Or are you going to work on your rotten attitude? I can tell you what you're going to do if he's there in your house. You know what you're going to do? Well, Lord, everybody's got a problem with their attitude. 
Rebellions as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry. I'm trying to help you here. You're conjuring another spirit. You're opening the door. You're opening the window. It doesn't take much. He's like a cockroach. You seal the door ceiling, I mean the door uh, threshold, you get everything sealed up in the house. I mean it's so tight it looked like an ark, it would float. And then where'd the roach come from? He flattened himself, squeezed through and popped out on the other side. I don't know how they do it, but they find a way in. You've got pesticides everywhere. You've got to walk around in your own house with a gas mask on because you've got pesticides. And here comes a roach with a gas mask. <laughs> and wings so that when you go to swat him, he flies in your face. You say, what is that? If you leave a crack, he'll find it. I can control lying. You're thinking now. No, no. When you lie, you know you're lying. If I add to that the thought, when I lie, I've said, come in, I might be able to get my lying under control. If I'm thinking, I just opened a door and said to the devil, come on in. Because the Holy Spirit is not comfortable with lying. The Lord doesn't lie. But the devil will lie all the time. He is the father of all lies. Big ones, little ones, white ones, black ones, it don't matter. He's the father of all lies. You see what happened? Makes him feel comfortable. Oh, they're living like I live. This is great, man. Sure, we'll move in. And sometimes it's difficult to keep living that lie, isn't it, ma'am? To keep thinking that you're everything that you think you really are when you stopped being that 20 years ago. You ever told yourself the lie that you're more popular than you really are? That everybody just thinks you're the bride at the wedding and the corpse at the funeral? And then your feelings are hurt because when you walk up to the party, everybody's not as impressed with you as you are with yourself. And then it's always the people's fault because they didn't see you as the princess at the ball. And then your favorite story is Cinderella because everybody else is the wicked witch and the wicked stepsisters because they didn't do what you thought they should do. You ever lie to yourself and convince yourself that when somebody tells you there's something wrong with you, that you think they're lying and you won't accept that truth? Number two, just a few of these. Look in verse number 26. Can you read it? Be you what? But then what does he say? Is there a way to be angry and not sin? I've got a good example for you. The Lord was angry about the right things. He found out that they were using the table there and he turned over the table. And he said, you made my father's house of prayer into a den of thieves. He was angry, right? He turned over the tables, made a whip and drove them out. Right? But that righteous indignation, would that be the kind of anger that you show? When we're talking about anger, can you put yourself in that same condition? Or might you be like the man in the Bible, again, law of first mention would be there. Might you be like the guy in the Bible named Cain? Who, when he did wrong, the Lord said to him, Cain, hold on now. I'll give you the modern version. Listen, don't you know if you bring what I want you to bring, we're good. And Cain said, well, what do you want? And he said, I want a lamb. It's a picture. It's a type. It's what your mom and dad had to have. So you got to bring that. I'm a farmer. I bring vegetables. If you ain't happy with vegetables and fruits, that's on you because I'm not a shepherd. The Lord said, you're right, you're not. But I provided a way for you to bring a lamb. You don't have to raise the lamb. You don't have to care for the lamb. You don't have to take care of the lamb. All you have to do is go to get a lamb. Hold on just a minute, Lord. 
<coughs> there's not a whole lot of us here yet. And there's only one shepherd. The Lord said, good, so you've got a place you can go down and, and you can get a lamb. Oh, no, I'm vegetarian. Cain, this isn't for you to eat. This is for you to offer to me. Okay, Lord, let me get this right. If I want to get right with you and have you accept my offering, I have to bring a lamb. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> nothing to it. <laughs> May not be nothing for you, but that means I got to go fix it with my brother. And I ain't doing it. Second warning, Cain. Sin lies at the door. That anger is going to drive you to do something stupid, boy. You better stop. You better get it under control. Oh, if I do that, Abel will think he's right. This ain't about Abel, Cain. This is about you. More importantly, it's about what I want from you. You're sucking air because of me. Your heart's beating because of me. You can see, walk, feel, touch, taste because of me. Now, Cain, listen, the crops that you brought, they're there because of me. Now, what I'm saying is you don't have it within you to bring what I want. It's a picture, Cain, that you have to go get something to bring. You can't do it on your own, Cain. You got to go get a lamb. You're telling me I got to get right with my brother to be right with you? That's, yeah, you got it. That's great. It even spells out that in original Hebrew. That's perfect. You got it. Uh-uh. No, I don't. I ain't doing it. And that lie turns into a anger. He lets the sun go down on it, and it ultimately results in murder. Now, wait a minute, preacher. <laughs> You're getting a little carried away. Am I really getting carried away? Could I ask you a question? If the devil was a thief and a liar and a murderer from the beginning, do you have to actually physically kill somebody to kill them? I've seen a Christian murder another person's reputation. Murder it. Won't resurrect again. Just had to put something out there to let, not, not for the benefit of the person, but to let everybody know, I, I already knew. I, I knew I'm in the know. You're a murderer. You don't care who it slaughters as long as everybody knows you knew. You are the one to come to for the latest intel on the Christians. We're just going to pray for them. All the maggots are down there going, hiding under that veneer of so righteous, the slaughter of another Christian's reputation. I've seen Christians that have slaughtered that reputation of someone else. I've seen them kill their joy. Yes. Here's the dangerous thing about that, if you can bear with me for just a minute, at least Brother Val will for a second. The joy of the Lord is our... And then he also says, I would have you to abide in my joy, that your joy may be full. Deuteronomy tells me that the joy of the Lord is my strength, but because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joy and with happiness or gladness of heart, I will put a yoke of iron upon you. Type picture of the devil. Why? Because joy is important. So if I murder that joyous spirit in you because I'm holding you to a level of accountability that you can't account to and I never let you off the mat, I've killed your joy. I've taken your strength, Samson. 
I've taken your ability to fight effectively on the spiritual battlefield in which we are engaged. I have then had the power to take from you the strength as Delilah took the hair off of Samson all of a sudden because I have done or said something that directly affects your reputation without thinking a moment about the collateral damage. Because ladies and gentlemen, you've always wanted to be a hold of or a part of something bigger than yourself. Let me just tell you, you are. You affect and infect the entire body of Christ. God doesn't look down and just see this little nucleus and this little nucleus and this little nucleus. He sees us as a family together as the body of Christ. And when we murder when we slay, when we kill, when we strangle the life out of another Christian, we have now committed spiritual homicide. And sometimes, you know what? They don't recover and they never resurrect. Well, preacher, when you put it like that, see, you cannot kill a person physically where the big dogs will come and investigate you and draw a line around where you were and put all the evidence together and the DNA samples and have the witnesses and all that. But boy, you can kill somebody socially. You can kill their reputation and you can ruin them spiritually and have committed a sin worse than Cain committed. You see what happened? Just let anger get out of control. Before long, you know what happens? Cain goes out. Everybody around Cain, you don't find any record of any of those around Cain ever amounting to anything. Unrighteous anger. You ever come home and talk to your kids about your boss? You ever do that and then one day they go to the, I don't know, the afternoon barbecue or whatever and they're looking for the Antichrist? Because that's all you've ever said about them. Not grateful for a paycheck. <laughs> not, not grateful I have a job. Just that stinking devil does this and that stinking devil does that and that stinking devil does that. Do you ever, do you ever find anything good about anybody except yourself? Do you ever say, you know what? Hey, you know what? <laughs> Thank the Lord they, um, uh, well, they came to church. Amen. And they're breathing air. Yes. That critical spirit can oftentimes lead to murder. Look, if you will, quickly. Let him that stole steal no more. Gossip can certainly steal from somebody else. You say, what is that? Busybody can steal. But it's, more than, but, it's, but it's much more than that. You ever steal time from God? For what you want to do? I'm just, I'm just asking. He said, let him that steals steal no more. Well, I'm, I'm a Christian. I don't want to be a liar. Okay, then God's first, right? No. No, I'm taking his time for me. I know you're going to be uncomfortable, and I know some of you parents are going to be good and mad at me. But you're training a generation of people to say, my time's mine. So you know what it leads to? It leads to Sunday afternoon ball games. It leads to people not coming to church because they got tickets to the ball game. As if that time's yours. Hey, it is free will. You can do with it what you want. How about your talent? Are you as quick to display the talents that God's given you for the Lord as you are for your own benefit? Can you sing? Can you play? I saw some, shall we say, some elderly people that were here during cleanup day. Not, I don't, if you weren't able to come, I know you had a good reason. To, don't, don't read into that. You say, what were they doing? Oh, nothing much, just pushing a broom. They really couldn't do a whole lot more. They were just doing what they could do. You ever, you ever steal his time? 
You ever take your talents and use that, use your brain for yourself as opposed to using it for him? You ever steal his forgiveness of you but don't apply it to somebody else? You surely wouldn't be guilty of being kind of, you know, like a lot of streets we have in town called one way. You surely wouldn't be that way. You'd be the recipient of such God's grace, but you would steal that blessing, that privilege from being able to offer that to somebody else. Could I remind you of 2 Corinthians? He said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, neither give place. We're not ignorant of his devices. What is that device? That device is that unforgiving spirit. I'm not going to stay on it too long because y'all are starting to kind of wiggle now. And it ain't because we've been here long. We've only been here about 10 minutes so far, but okay, I just lied. I've been here about 25 minutes. <laughs> the Lord said, careful now. <laughs> Do you ever steal that? The blessings of seeing God forgive somebody else and then you forgiving them and saying, boy, sure I'm glad you got right with the Lord. You ever take that? From somebody else? Did you leave an adequate return? He forgave you. He took it from you, right? He left an adequate return. Yes. Yes. Did you leave an adequate return? Did you forgive him? I don't know if you gave him. I don't know if you did or not. But you wouldn't be jumping around like a jelly bean in a boxcar right now if you had. You say, why? We can all get them grudges going, can't we? And we forget how good God's been to us, can't we? Amen. You say, what is it? It's an example of God's grace. Hey, if God can forgive me, He forgave you, good. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're back in. Let's get at it. Yes, sir. Who's that applied to? Everybody in here. Yes, sir. Some of you are that way about your wife or your husband. I think the problem is, is that on a regular basis, turn to the next page, if you will, please look in verse number 29. I'm trying to bring it to a close. I think sometimes you forget that you're not all of everything you claim to be. You're what God knows you to be. Yes. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to look at you and say, did you offer to them the same thing I gave to you? Yes. Preacher, I never stole nothing. I can see every time I bring this passage up, I can see that old preacher. I can see those guys sitting down there on the front row and stuff and he's over there drawing, he's drawing a picture of Jesus on the cross and he's going through the whip marks and he said, that'll be for stealing. And the guy, one of the guys would say, well, I never stole nothing and this and that. They keep talking among themselves about what they're not guilty of, not what they're guilty It's like being in a regular church service. All the crimes they didn't commit, not the one that put them in prison. It's all the things they didn't do, right? And I watched him turn around with that chalk and take that hand and scratch his nose like that and turn around and he'd say, you sure you hadn't stole nothing? Any of you boys ever plucked the rose of purity off of a young girl's cheek? You're a thief. Yeah, it hit in prison just like it hit right there. You're a Christian, are you? You're a thief. Ephesians chapter 6, look in verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. What are we trying to do? I'm trying to keep the devil from getting in your life. Amen. Filthy speech, foolish jesting evil communication, whether you like it or not. Unclean spirits dwell in that. They're like the buzzards we talked about on Wednesday night. They love dead things. Words hurt people. Speech that hurts, it tears down. He said, but that which is good to the edifying. Well, but preacher, you know, sometimes, you know, you just have to tell them the truth and just have to, sometimes the truth hurts, you know. Careful, you reap what you sow. Judge not lest you be judged, for in whatso manner you judge, you shall also be judged. Right. 
He doesn't say don't judge. He says you better be judging according to the book. Sticks and stones will break my bones. The words in there. You know, Christians, you know, they're so thin-skinned now. Careful, careful. He uses words to get you, and words can hurt. Amen. Amen. Words can tear you up. Amen. You ever have a house divided against itself because husband wants one thing, wife wants another thing, and the next thing you know, the evil communication slips in, and then before long, he's got his team, she's got her team. Sure. What benefit is that? You say, what happens? Every time those things take place, you see, well, they start picking up communications. The little bird told me, well, I heard this. Well, I heard that. Well, did you hear this? Did you hear that? Well, I didn't hear this, but I heard that. But yeah, I didn't hear that. I didn't know that, but I knew this. Did you know this? Did you know that? No, I didn't know this, but I didn't know that. But I knew this, but I didn't know that. But now that I know that, then I can tell you this. And then I can tell you this, and I can tell you that. And then I can do that kind of stuff. Stop, stop, stop. Stop it. It's corrupt. We're talking about giving place to the devil. That's not esteeming. That's not edifying. That's not helping. That's not encouraging. It's demeaning. It is putting somebody down. It is stomping somebody to exalt yourself at their expense. Does it have to be known by everybody? See, what is it? It's the devil. If y'all don't pray where I'm headed with this, I'm going to get the tar knocked out of me starting this afternoon. And there's going to be some of you that are going to be upset about me talking about the devil because the devil is comfortable living in you. And has so twisted your mind to think that when you say it, it's righteous. Can I say this with all due respect? Can you just let me say it without sounding arrogant or obnoxious? I've been here 31 years. We started in my living room. I've been around this long enough to know just a few things. And without any question, without any contest at all, words and the misuse of those words has done far more damage than every other thing put together. Smoking, drinking, cussing, drugs, fornication, adultery, uh, everything you can think of, by far. Amen. I said, I need to get a giant stapler. And the next time you have duck lips... You say, why? There is nothing that means you're more full of yourself than your di steady diet is the talking about, the digesting of everybody else's life. It means you must not have one. I'm not trying to be hard, but could you mind your own cotton-picking business? Well, preacher, no, we're all guilty. You say, why? It makes the devil comfortable. Because yeah. you're doing it because I, I love you, I care. I'm so concerned about you. I'm so, I'm so worried. I just, I just let, no, 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 you're wanting a gossip column. <laughs> you ever tell somebody this? Now, I'm going to tell you something. But you cannot tell anyone else. You ever said that before? Brother Roger, you're still with me? Okay, just checking. You ever said that to anybody? And then the next thing you know, somebody comes up and goes, Preacher, I heard so-and-so. And you're like... I only told one person. So you go back to that one person and you go, Hey, what's up? Oh, I didn't tell anybody. Well, I mean, I told my wife. <laughs> wow, well, like, beep, 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 boop, 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 you know, just threw her right under the bus. Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I, did, I told one of my friends, but I mean, they can always, 
oh, okay, well, here's what you need to know. I told you, don't tell anyone because I needed to bounce this off of somebody. And now it's come around and so-and-so told me, I don't know how they found out about it. I didn't tell them. Okay, here's the problem. I know I didn't tell them. Right? I know I only told you. How it got to everybody else, that's on you. Because I didn't tell anybody. Say, what is it? Loose lips. You know what happens in the body of Christ? Loose lips. A few shots across the bow, and before long they got a big cannon hole just below the bow line there. And the ship's going down. But hey, you knew about it before it sunk, didn't you? They still sunk. I'm telling you, if I have any credibility at all after the amount of years I've been here, I'm telling you, words have done far more damage than any of those other things. You say, why? We never pay any attention to that. There's something in us that thinks that now that we're saved and given the responsibility to pray, and because of the affluence and influence of social media, we think it's okay to be in everybody's business. Where they should go to school? Are they your kids? Did they ask you? Where they should work? Are they your kids? Is it your wife? Is it your husband? Did they even ask you? The job they took? It's the devil. It's the, it's the devil. The, de the, the Lord wouldn't have you work there. Well, unless it's a strip club or a beer joint, you don't know that. You don't know that. You want to pay their bills while they're still looking for a job? Amen. Your, your life is literally so meaningless that you can give everybody this... this I, uh, well, listen, I'm such a success. Let me tell you how I think you should live your life. Whew. But now all of a sudden, you know what? You don't, you don't care because now you've robbed them because of your communication. Now they're talking to you instead of talking to him. i got to hurry. I hope this is making some sense to you. Amen. Preacher, I've heard all this before. What caused problem for Saul? It was all the conversation about David. What did Saul try to do? He tried to destroy David's reputation to get people on his side. The same thing happened with Joseph's brothers. Right? Until the Lord flipped the whole script. Preacher, do we have a problem with this? Listen, I'm just giving you what the Bible says. Evil speaking, slander. The devil is an accuser of the, of the brethren. Slander and gossip go hand in hand. Remember the illustration I gave you about the feather pillow? Remember that? You ever been the recipient of that? That you said some things and it kind of got out there and then you found out it wasn't exactly like I thought it was. It's just what I heard third hand twice removed. Wouldn't accept it in court hearsay, but it fit your agenda at the time. And then all of a sudden, somebody calls you on it and it's like, uh. so you go see the old preacher and he says, go get you a feather pillow. Go to downtown Hemming Plaza on a real, real windy day like some of the days we've had lately and take a knife and split that feather pillow up and shake all those feathers out. And go back a week later and try to gather them. And see how many feathers you get back. Some of those feathers you never get back. Wouldn't it be better to have just never spread the feathers in the first place? Where was the benefit? Where's the, where, where's the good in that? Put your eyes back there the other day and I, I saw this Sunday school teacher and she's dressing down one of them kids. Okay. What's she going to do about it? What, what, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I wasn't there. I'd have to talk to the teacher. I'd have to talk to the kid. 
Oh, come to find out it's you don't really like the Sunday school teacher and now you found a reason because you want her called on the carpet because maybe the kid needed to be gotten onto, but you didn't like the fact that. Mm -hmm. yep. Amen. And the parent has already told the Sunday school teacher, if my kid acts up, yep. Yep. right? Amen. We know we're not dealing with angels. We know you have your little demons. I understand that. They're here. They look like angels now, but then they kind of change that sometimes. Sometimes they have bad days, don't they? Sometimes you have bad days, don't you? Amen. Okay, don't, don't be that way. It's like, well, how could he dare call my kid a little demon? That's better than what some of you call them. But I'd be willing to bet you that ain't what you call them in prayer. Let me show you a progression. Let me show you the dangerous of these words. Verse number 31, I'll, I'll close out. He says, let some of that bitterness. Could you please underline that? Some of you, you know what? You've been bitter for years and you know what happens? It finally explodes. And it's like nitroglycerin going off. And man, the collateral damage is simply because it's been pent up for so long. And when it comes out, it just tears everything to shreds. I saw a guy, I have to rephrase. I, I did not see the guy. I got there within a minute or so. He jumped off of a third story downtown by the uh, center of the thing there. And we got called over there and I got over there. And, and when I got there, I mean, you could just about stir him with your foot. I mean, it was, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible. You can't unsee that. Well, you ought to be used to it. Okay, well, whatever. But I, I'm thinking, my goodness. But you know what I'll never forget? I'll never forget there was a lady. She's sitting over in a corner. Back in those days, they had these little entranceways into these stores that were there, and they had the glass storefronts. This is a lot of years ago. This will be, I don't know, early 80s or so. And she's sitting over in that corner. She's not homeless. She's not a drunk. She's not a drug addict. She's in a business suit. And she's literally, she is splattered with the collateral damage because somebody else jumped. And everybody was focused on that. And, and I just remember looking and she had a tissue in her hand and she was trying because she couldn't see, but she was trying her best to, to, you know, the look on her face of utter shock. Because when she left to go to lunch that day, she never thought somebody was going to jump and land three or four feet from her and literally explode all over her. I'll be willing to bet you this. I'll be willing to bet you that if I were to see that lady today, that that thought, that vision, that horrible sight is as fresh today as it was 40, 40 plus years ago. That's what their anger does when it explodes, when that bitterness builds. And then before long, there's collateral damage and you don't even know the ones that get hit by it. It damages a church in irreparable ways from people that were just going to lunch. They just came in to sit down and enjoy a church service. Man, I'm glad I'm in church. Boy, I had a good time in Sunday school. Wasn't the music good? Weren't those kids a blessing? Wasn't past me not wonderful and hallelujah and... And you know what they do? They're sitting over in the corner. And they spend the rest of their life trying to wipe it off. You say, where are they? They're like Mephibosheth. They're all out here. They've fallen because somebody else fell. Notice quickly in the passage, bitterness. What happens with bitterness? It turns to wrath. We've talked about that. It's right in the passage. Then comes anger. We've talked about that. Are you beginning to see the progression? I have a right to be angry. It's a slow burn. It's kind of a smoldering kind of heat. It just... It's like in the old days, they would tell me with those uh, pink colored, sort of reddish colored rags that had that product in them, they'd say, listen, because you're wiping up oil and gasoline and petroleum products, don't throw them over there in the corner. You get them stacked up together, the, the, they begin to put off heat. 
And before long, you don't need to do anything. Everybody put a match to it. All of a sudden, that it smolders for a little while, and then it'll begin to smoke. And then before long, you know what happens? It's right in the passage. Then the clamor. <laughs> There's a spontaneous combustion. Clamor, by the way, if you want to look it up later on, it's where you get your word claymore. You military guys know what a claymore mine is. Some of you want to be military guys. I, I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner that weren't ever able to, but you know what a claymore is. It has a funny shape to it. You know what it does? It's shaped out this way and is intended to go out and destroy as many people as it possibly can. It is not intended to kill. It is intended to wound. You say, why? Because it takes generally two to carry one and I can do more with wounded people to slow down the advance of the enemy than I can with dead people. And you say, what happens? Before long, boy, you're mad. Clamor is the escalation. It's the loud noise. It's all of a sudden the voice gets turned up real loud. And then before long, we have the malice that comes in. And it's at that point after the evil speaking comes in where you intentionally hurt somebody just because you can. Yeah. And what is the evil speaking? That's, you know, the stuff that you'll say like, I wish I'd have never married you. I want a divorce. I want out. I'm done. I'm through. I'm finished. I can make it on my own. I don't need you. You say, what is that? The evil speaking. Now you're saying stuff. You can't take it back. Boy, you're putting a deep wound in there. Maybe the marriage survives it, but you know what? Well, if I go to that point again, you know what's going to happen? <laughs> and out comes the foul language. And out comes the insurrection. And out comes the indignation. And I'm right. And then before long, the final coup de grace of the devil taking full possession of you, that passage ends with the word malice. You know, malice is a strange word that your King James Bible would use it to describe the ending of this entire chapter. It's an odd word. You say, why? Because when the devil fully gets you, you are so consumed with yourself, you don't care who you hurt. You are intentionally hurting people and you don't care. It's not just intentionally hurting them. It is intentionally hurting them and you don't care. You're a psychopath. You're in the likes of John Wayne Gacy and you're in the likes of Ted Bundy where you don't care. You torture people. The more they scream, the more you like. You're not happy unless somebody is hurting. You say, it will never be me. That's what the devil does. I heard the old preacher one time and he was describing some things about the devil and it was during a question and answer thing but I took special note to it because he said, he said, what do you think, or the question was, preacher, what do you think it'll be like uh, when the devil is cast into the lake of fire? How do you think that's going to be at the end of the thing? And he thought for a minute and he paused for a second and he said, let me see if I can figure out how to put this in words. He said, it's like this. He said, the more torture, the more pain, the more agony the more anger that he sees in the people that are there, the more joy he gets out of it. Yes. He said if the devil could sit in and hell and listen to you scream and yell, he would laugh and say, this is great. That's malice. Yeah. He hates God so bad, he doesn't care who he hurts or destroys. Right. Here's the question. Is the Lord comfortable inside or have you made the devil comfortable inside? Do you have that sort of rebellious neighbor when, you know, Nana and Papa tell you to do something and you have a natural, y'all old, you ain't going to tell me what to do. That ain't the Lord. You know what the Lord said? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know what the Bible said? Children, obey your parents. This is right in the Lord, that their days may be long upon the, long upon the face of the earth. You know what he says? He says, you're supposed to do that. You sure the devil ain't comfortable in you? When your teacher tells you what to do? When the police tells you what to do? Why do you resist authority so bad? That's a trait of the devil. The Lord never went against authority. Hey, Lord, you know, what about paying taxes and all that? 
Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar, render God the things that are God. Next question. Are you going to fight against me? Don't you know if it was my time, I'd fight against you and I'd win too, but it's not my time. Do what you got to do. See you later. Have a nice day. When reviled, you reviled not again. Are you going to say the devil's not in there because you're always in a fit with somebody? You ever look at your life? I want to encourage you to do it. You should write a journal. You know what you should do? If you're always at odds with somebody, you need to write it down. You say, why? You'll begin to see a pattern. You say, what do you see? You'll see who's in residence. That's good. You'll see who's man in the controls. You'll see the guy behind the curtain. And it ain't a little man running controls in the Wizard of Oz either. So the message is for the purpose of trying to instruct Christians in the last days. Are we going to have failures? Yep. Are we going to have mess up? No question. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? What the people in the church need nowadays is they need a place that they can come and they can find what God gave you. Amen. Amen. A chance to start over yes. and get going again and maybe a mountain. You gain nothing when somebody gets out. You gain nothing. When somebody doesn't make you any better. See so what happens? What do they need? Come on back. Welcome home. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. <clears throat> I feel this morning that I should simply say this to you. If you want to come, I'm not going to have anybody play. I don't want an emotional response. But if you find yourself, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you find yourself in a position there where you even have an idea that Tobiah has moved into the residence the place that only God belongs, could I encourage you to say, you know what? I don't like him being in here. And I want him out. Nobody's going to look around. I'm not going to say anything to you. I'm not going to come to you after the service. And is there anything I can help you with? I'm not going to preach it and then not do it. But I'll help you any way I can. But you need to know, as the pastor of this place, you're in a safe haven. I don't care about the fringers and what they may or may not do. You're in a safe haven. And if you want to come and talk to the Lord about it, I will defend your right to do so. And I'll watch your back while you're praying. If God spoke to you and you find yourself in those passages this morning, say, Preacher, I think maybe I got some windows and some doors open. I got... Maybe a threshold or two with a hole in it. I need to seal some things up. Okay, good, good. That's what you want to do. You seal it all up, you close it up, and then you cover it with the blood. It's impenetrable. He can't get past the blood. That's what your soul is covered with. Preacher, this thing keeps getting in here. Okay, good. Cover it with the blood. Lord, cover it up. Cover it up. Not hide it. Not gonna, Lord, I need you to wash me. Cover it up. Seal it up. I don't want him getting in anymore. I'm fighting with everything I got. Good. Put some sealer on it. It's the best flex seal you've ever seen in your life. It'll cover holes you don't even know are there. You know, God spoke to you. Would you come? Would you come? Would you just throw up your hand and say, Preacher, I can't get him out. You can't. You can't get him out. You hear me? You have to have him help you. Nehemiah came in there. Nobody else could get Tobiah out. Nehemiah went in there and he said, I'll get him out. I'll get him out. And he got him out. Now God spoke to you. Give you a minute or two. And then we're going to close. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's judging nothing. Don't you let the devil tell you that. They're still trickling. We're waiting. No hurry. I know it's a serious message. It ain't fun at all. Especially on a Sunday morning. Especially after the kind of singing we had here this morning. But it's right and we need it. Batten down the hatches. Stand by for heavy rolls. The devil is going to turn up the heat. And if we're a Bible-believing church like we claim to be, then that means we are going to get hit. 
what we're getting hit with is not just the flesh. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. Now, Father, I, first of all, can't thank you enough for putting the many warnings in the Bible that are there, and I pray that I've done at least some kind of justice to try my best to bring out what you say clearly in the Bible that we often ignore, that we might better equip your people. I know, Lord, they have enough sense to make decisions and to do what's right to do. I'm just simply trying to fill their arsenal with the things that they need to be able to fight the spiritual battle that they are certain to have in their life. Especially as the curtain begins to close and things come to an end. God, I'd pray that you'll open up their blinded eyes, anoint them with eye salve. Help them to see their need for you. Help them to see past the confrontations and the things that have occurred in their life to recognize that and they're simply being used and manipulated as a puppet for the devil against you. And help them to recognize that. Help them to cry out to you. Help them to call out to you. Help them to beg you to give them help to overcome them things. Lord, I'm aware. I know how difficult some of those things would be. And I know that without you supernaturally helping them, their heart is not big enough to be able to do what's necessary to be done. And pray, Lord, that you'll protect not just the words that have been spoken today, but also the hearers of those words also. And those that choose to be not just a hearer only, but a doer, and to try their best to do some things to dislodge, to dethrone, to kick out, to remove the devil from your rightful place. And I'd ask, Lord, that you would protect me my family, this church, my church family, and these people, Lord, because I realize, I recognize clearly that it's not a joke, it's not a game, and that who I've talked about today definitely does not have my best interest. And while he may have had his back turned toward me for a while, because I have now mentioned him, I'm positive he's headed in our direction. And the only thing I can do, Lord, is do what you told me to do, say what you told me to say, and trust you to protect me, and I'm asking you for it. Please protect these people, this congregation, that have had the courage, the guts, the backbone to listen to what's been said and to respond to it. Thank you for the liberty to preach this type of a message, Lord, and it not be fun and games and a whole lot of laughter going on, but it's taken seriously. Reward these people for their willingness to listen. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.